know thy enemy, um, as they say, right, from Art of War. I'm sure you've all read that. I wanted to take a um, some time out this this week during this module and kind of really dig into energy sources because really when we start talking about solutions and we're on the kind of back end, it's going to be important to understand what the problems are. Know thy enemy. So we spent a lot of time last week going through all the details and the ins and outs, the carbon cycle, the fast carbon, the slow carbon. And one of the things that we pointed out is there's this chunk of carbon in various forms that's in the slow carbon, that's in the rock cycle. And what we are doing or yeah, actively doing or have done significantly over the last 150 years is take that energy, pull it out of the rock cycle, use it um, for combustion essentially, and kind of reap the benefits of the energy that that creates. And so I wanted to actually go through a little bit and talk about some of those details um, because hopefully once you understand what that's all about, we can start to think about ways that we can do it in a different sense. So the story is actually gonna start with a lowly bar magnet and a piece of wire. Um, when we think about wire, we could just imagine copper, right? There's a few different reasons why we use copper. Um, we also use aluminum. But one of the things that happens in any metals, the definition of a metal, is that those electrons that are stuck to the neutrons in that crystal lattice, they're free to move around, um, kind of moving from one nuclei to the other, um, kind of one atom to the other, displacing another electron, and they're all kind of bouncing around, and these electrons are freely moving around. If you were to kind of average all of them, they'd have no trend. They'd all just be moving in chaos. Um, that's great, right? The fact that electrons can move. One of the things that we've learned is that if you take a magnetic field, so a, a, the magnetic field is very similar to an electric field. They're kind of two different versions of the same thing. And if you take that magnetic field and you push it, so the magnetic field has to be moving, if you push it towards that piece of wire, all of the electrons in response are gonna move either away or toward, depending on the orientation of the magnet and which direction you're pushing or pulling. Um, and that pushes electrons. That creates what we call a current. The, the problem is if you do that once, you just push the magnet here, all the electrons are gonna move, but if the magnet stays there, all the electrons are then gonna go back and just do their thing. They're not just repelled by the magnetic force. The magnetic field has to be in movement or what we describe as in flux. Um, and the simplest way to do that is if we were to imagine taking a nail and sticking it through our magnet in this direction and hooking that nail up to something that was spinning, a water wheel maybe, and that magnet was constantly rotating or moving, that magnetic field would always be in flux and those electrons would always be moving. That's how electricity is made. Um, the spinning magnet, right? The spinning magnet is kind of a, a, a description of the modern world, right? So kind of figuring out electricity, all of these different ways that we use to generate electricity are just, <coughs> all of these different ways that we generate electricity are just really different and creative ways to spin the magnet. Um, and in general, we boil water lots of different ways and we make steam from that water, we condense that steam and we use that steam to spin, basically like if you imagine blowing on a little kid's you know, um, pinwheel, we use that steam to spin something similar to a pinwheel and that has a magnet attached to it. That's the whole deal. Um, but we've come up with lots of different ways to do that. Um, as we go through these discussions, there's going to be one notable exception that we'll loop back through that doesn't actually spin the magnet. So that brings us to our first um, of what we call the fossil fuels. The fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. Excuse me. Generally, we use coal and natural gas for electricity generation. Oil, we 
often kind of the, the majority use of oil is actually for transportation, but it's the same reaction. It's creating energy in a different form. Um, so coal is plants, right? Plant material. This, again, not a geology class, but a whole section on coal if you're interested. But basically what happens is trees will die. Woody material is made out of what we call cellulose. And as that material dies, first of all, if nothing's there to eat it, which was true during the Carboniferous period, which was most of our coal formed, these plants would die in these anoxic environments and they would just pile up and they wouldn't decompose and they became buried. So what happens is here, we actually have, this is a generic chemical formula for cellulose. So this is like uncompressed plant matter. And so here's kind of a quick geological cross section. My marker is running out. I might have to switch to blue. It seems to be better. Um, but you can imagine this layer of organic material piled with, you know, buried under some amount of, of rock material. And as the pressure increases, some interesting changes start to happen in the chemistry. So if you look here, we've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. As that cellulose is being compressed, the hydrogen will oxidize. And so if we think about that, I'm going to rewrite that formula here, C6H10, or C5, or yeah, C6, excuse me, H10O5. Um, and if we were to take one oxygen and oxidize these two hydrogen, what we would find is that we actually form something fairly similar, H2O. But now this is deficient one H2O, so we still have C6, H8, O4. So the percentage of carbon in relation to these other things is getting higher. And if we continue to squish this and continue to press this, pull another water out of here, now we have C6, H6, O3, and kind of on down the line until eventually basically just have pure carbon left. Because of that, coal actually comes in different grades. The pure carbon coal is, is something that we call anthracite. It's actually fairly rare. Um, the coal that we generally burn for, uh, for electricity, for power, that comes out of Wyoming is in the range of like in the high 70s. So maybe 75 to 85% carbon. That's a type of coal that we call bituminous coal, which is not quite like the highest grade coal that there is. But it's fairly common. We've got lots of it, particularly in Wyoming, where most of our coal comes from. Let's switch to blue. C is for coal. It's also the chemical element, right? Carbon. So um, what we're going to see now is that carbon will react with oxygen. Again, what we call an oxidation reaction. You're familiar with this one because we call it combustion reaction. So essentially, carbon will mix with oxygen free oxygen in the atmosphere, diatomic oxygen, and the result is energy and CO2, right? Carbon bonded with oxygen. So, that. so this is what we would categorize as an exothermic chemical reaction, meaning it gives off energy, it gives off heat. Um, but you know that this is basically the same thing that happens in a campfire, right? It's oxidation. So one of the big kind of morals of the story, and we're going to see this kind of over and over, is that carbon mixed with oxygen gives off energy and CO2. That's a really easy way to boil water, right? If we go back to thinking about what we're trying to do to create energy. Okay, well, this is, this is not how it really looks, but it's actually pretty close. And what it's going to allow us to do is kind of look at how a coal-fired power plant works. And at that point, it's actually going to be pretty easy for us to talk about some other sources of power. Because in one sense, they're all kind of the same, right? 
Um, so, what we've got going on here is we've got a pile of coal that a train dropped off or some trucks dropped off or someone came with a bucket of coal. It takes way more than that. Um, and essentially that coal is crushed into something similar to sand, like tiny little particles, because the combustion reaction happens on the outside of the coal, so it works way better, right? Like kindling burns easier than a big log, right? So we take that crushed coal and we put it in a boiler or kind of a furnace. Again, this is just kind of an illustrative diagram. It's a little more complicated than this in the real world. But essentially what happens is that coal is sitting in here burning and there's a closed system of water. There's pipes there that go through um, the furnace area um, and that creates boiling water which creates steam. That steam is then piped to a turbine thinking like pinwheel here, blowing on your, your pinwheel as a little kid, your rainbow one. Um, and that spins the turbine. The turbine itself is connected to either a bundle of copper wires, which is one way to do it, or a magnet. For our purposes, we'll just talk about spinning the magnet. And that's contained then, kind of, or surrounded by these copper wires. That spinning of the magnet creates a flow of electrons, and that creates electricity that goes off into the market. Great. Um, the water is recondensed. I kind of drew this here. This isn't exactly how this works. And that, to condense it, it needs to be cooled. So we have these big cooling towers you often see. Um, they, they're common also at nuclear power plants with these big kind of evaporative coolers. Um, but that's really just to re recondense the water. And then the water is cycled back through. And so this is great. But in the case of coal, remember, we've got this primary combustion reaction. So out these smokestacks is coming CO2. Um, there's a lot of other problems associated with this kind of in an ecological point of view, but here we're just really going to be talking about impacts on the climate. As So coal often also actually has iron pyrite, iron sulfide, as um, kind of a mineralogical impurity. So not only do we get CO2, but we actually get um, sulfur dioxide produced as well, SO2, um, that goes through that combustion reaction. Um, and also, kind of thinking about things that affect climate, there's particulates. A large portion of this ends up being what we call coal ash. So it doesn't burn completely, just like wood in your fireplace. But there's also particulate matter that ends up in the form of aerosols that goes out into the atmosphere. We call that stuff fly ash. And just looking at this big picture, there's a few different things that we can do to make this burn better. Um, so thinking about coal solutions, um, one of the things that we can do is what we call coal washing, where we take a piece of coal and we crush it again into this kind of sand-sized particle. And then we actually take that in a circular tub of water and we swirl it around. Um, we slurry it with water and what happens is the heaviest particles settle at the bottom, which actually tends to be the metals. So we can then pull that off as a waste product and then take the kind of remaining coal that has less um, iron sulfide in it, re kind of pelletize that in these little sand grains and use that. That adds cost, right? And coal's big advantage is that it's cheap. Um, another thing that we do is we actually can have essentially like sprinklers within the smokestack or in a separate path that the exhaust goes through, and that's called wet scrubbing, and that can react with some of the CO2, strip some of that out. Um, there's this um, big similar process called carbon capture and sequestration which we run this exhaust through a fluid that has chemicals in it that actively bond to the carbon. 
It's a little bit of a boondoggle, but you actually hear about it in the realm of politics all the time. It's what they call clean coal. Um, it doesn't really work in practice. Kind of sketches out on paper. Um, and then another thing that we do is we can actually add these almost like very similar to the Dyson blade air filter. Um, these kind of metal, um, yeah, these metal blades that have a, an electrical charge. And those actually draw particles, particularly fly ash. Those are what we call electrostatic precipitators. So all of those things add cost to coal, but this is kind of how it all works. So what we're gonna see, we're gonna move to some other things. I'll modify this drawing a little bit. And one of the things that hopefully you'll understand is that, first of all, this isn't the only way to spin the magnet. Um, it's not the only way to do it with fossil fuels. Um, but the problems are different.